Hey everybody, welcome to Urban Crest Online. What a great day to join with one another in worship of our Lord. Pastor Tom has such a powerful word to share with us today about how to overcome evil with good. How to approach an enemy, an adversary, somebody who is against you with love. It is gonna be such an encouraging and enlightening word. So I hope you've got your notebook ready because today's word, like I said, is fire. But before we get into that, it is time to join our hearts in worship. So stand up wherever you are, lift your hands to the heavens, and lift your voices too. I don't know if you're ready, but I'm ready. So let's go. I find my hope in you. I find my hope, my help, my power. I gotta find my peace all in you, in Christ alone. Thank you. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest
Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that lives are changed at the calling out of the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to We want to take a moment in our service right now to have a time of prayer. And before I pray, I'd like to read one verse of scripture for us today. You know, if you watch any news at all, or certainly you've been listening to the events happening in our country, there's a word that I've heard many, many times listed these last couple of weeks, and that is the word unrest. Seems like our nation, seems like many, many lives are in a state of unrest right now. But let's take great comfort in the Word of God. Psalm 37 in verse 7 says this, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. 
That may sound very hard to do, but I want us to join together in prayer and ask the Lord to bring us a spirit of rest in our lives and in our country today. Would you join me in that prayer? Father, we come together today as a church family asking you as the Prince of Peace to bring rest into our homes, rest into our lives, and rest into our nation. Father, we need you to guide us, to walk with us, and Father, to guide us during these difficult days. I pray for those in authority over us. I pray for those that are watching over us. But Father, again, we desperately need you today. I pray as we continue our worship and as we listen to your word proclaimed today, that we would be reminded that our true rest is found in you. Thank you, Lord, for the promise and the gift of salvation. And we ask all this in the name above all of the names, the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Yeah. 
If you have your Bible this morning, open to the book of Romans chapter 12. We're going to be looking for this week and at least next week, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through verse 21. In a uh, Tuesday devotion I sent out this week to our folks, I talked about the fact that this was going to be one of our texts. And uh, Dr. Chuck Swindell, when he was writing his great book and commentary on Romans, he prefaced this section by calling it Christianity 101. Uh, In my Bible, it says, behave like a Christian. And so let's kind of read through uh, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, so we can get the core text. Then we're going to talk about where we're at in our country in relationship to this text. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with a brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligent, diligence rather, fervor and fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who are rejoicing and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Man, that's a good verse, isn't it? Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, Do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Man, I am so glad that the Bible is so relevant that it speaks to almost any situation we find ourselves in, in our nation today. I mean, yesterday was the, uh, in filming this, yesterday was the funeral of George Floyd. Uh, I spent most of my afternoon just praying for his family, those uh, loved ones that are left behind who have to pick up the pieces and go on, his wife, his daughter. And as I began to think about all of what is going on in our country, uh, I have been drawn to these two texts in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, and then chapter 13, 1 through 7. Understanding what was going on the day of Rome. Uh, This is about 57 AD when this is being written to us. Some will argue a year or two there. We'll just call it 57, okay? Um, In 49 AD, Caligula, the Roman emperor, there was so much animosity in the, the, in the city of Rome between the different uh, racial groups there, between Jew, Gentile, and now a, uh, what the Rome thought was a sect or a subdivision off of Judaism. And so Caligula just looked at the Jews and said, you guys fight all the time within yourself. And understand, he threw every one of them out, out of the city. I mean, they lost everything. And a couple of years later, as the Romans were wont to do, uh, somebody um, uh, poisoned Caligula, and another guy came on the throne, and his name was Nero. And Nero welcomed all the Jews to come back. And when the Jews had come back to Rome amongst the not only the Jewish believers, and now you have the Gentile believers, for three, four years, uh, Nero left them alone. Uh, he allowed them to... Um, exist, coexist, uh, didn't give him a whole bunch of mind or attention until he wanted to advance his own agenda. And then all of a sudden, persecution is going to break out um, almost unprecedented. I mean, he's feeding Christians to lions. It is a bizarre time in the history of Rome. I mean, uh, racism was at its highest and persecution of different races and ethnic groups, it was there. I was, I've was been listening and reading a lot from my fellow pastors and from others who have been writing and talking about this subject. And uh, Glenn Packiam, he is a lead pastor in uh, Colorado Rattle Springs 
uh, Colorado, one of the comments that he made, he said that even though I have lived 27 out of my 42 years in the United States, and I quote, I feel like I'm walking in on a 400-year-old family fight. He says, we have a lot we can learn by trying to understand what 246 years of slavery does to an entire group of people. And we are in the throes today of a lack of understanding. You remember in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and lack of understanding. Dr. Tony Evans, when he was asked to comment on this, just a part of his um, quotation said, he said, listen, let's resolve to be a part of the solution, not just a part of the complaint. Let's build a bridge with someone that's different than you. Then the two of you together go help someone who is worse off than the two of you in this understanding one another. I have preached most of my lifetime. I have used a catchphrase that says this. It's cruel not to tell people the truth. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. I have done an amazing amount of repenting over the last couple of weeks since this issue has raised itself in the United States of America again and admitting that as a pastor, as a white pastor in America, I'm part of the problem. You see, I preached to our church Sunday, last Sunday, on the value of a soul. And not only the value of a soul, but the value of every soul. And I make this commitment to you again today. I will never again allow racist comments to be around, with, around me in any form whatsoever that will go unchallenged. Never again. I will stand for the truth of the Word of God and I will preach it without reservation. The church today, I believe, is the number one problem in the area of racism. And let me get a little bit more particular. In particular, it's white church pastors that are the number one problem because we permit it. We allow it in our churches if, in some cases and or we don't preach on the subject the way we ought to preach on the subject. So may God forgive us all starting with me. Now, I want us to define racism. Um, boy, back in uh, 2000, I think it was 17, uh, a pastor in the uh, Texas area, his name is Robert Morris, and he preached a message then about the racial crisis in the United States of America. And his definition was one that has always uh, stuck with me. So understand, when I heard this definition, here's how he defines it. And he breaks it into three parts. And um, one, first of all, he says, it is hating a person because of race. Uh, that in itself, um, in my humble opinion, might be the, the worst. And then secondly, it's believing a race is either superior or inferior to another. And then finally, he says, racism is prejudice, understanding that the word prejudice, pre-judgment, pre means before, we judge before, uh, we're judging not based on facts, and we're judging towards another race. I tell you, my, my first real encounter with hating a person of another race came several years ago when my wife uh, Donna and I uh, traveled to the country of Israel. Uh, I had never, ever seen, I mean, I've, I've, I've been around racism in my life, but I've never been around such a hatred in racism that one group of people deemed another group of people not worthy to be on the planet. And I'm talking both ways. The Jewish nation and our, our uh, the, the Jewish heritage, they have battled this most of their existence because God put his stamp on the country of Israel and called them his chosen People, So they've been a target of the enemy ever since that took place. But I'm telling you, I watched the same hatred from the Jewish people towards the Palestinian. And it was overwhelming to me. And I'll be honest with you, what changed my heart and I know changed the heart of my wife and it became personal to her and to I was when we had toured the Israeli um, Holocaust Museum. I, we were there maybe two hours at the museum and uh, we went through and I, I didn't see anybody that went in with a dry eye that came out with a dry eye. 
if you ever get to go to Israel, I, I've never gone to Auschwitz to see the the horror of that there. I saw it in the pictures of the museum. And as we walked in, you began hearing these names randomly called. I mean, just one after another after another. And it never ceased. 24 hours a day, they were reading the names of the victims. And I cannot remember. I should have looked it up before now. If I remember correctly, it was astronomical and how many years it took just to read through the names of the victims nonstop. And Donna, as I, as I walked in and I looked at pictures of Auschwitz and you look at the pictures on the wall of, um, of mountainous, hear me, mountainous piles of children's shoes, glasses, and I won't get any more graphic than that. It, it became something very personal that I wanted to stand up against racism, against the Jews, and, and against the power. And God help us to ever think that a race of people, no matter who they are, have no right to exist. In that same definition of a sermon, Dr. Morris goes on to give seven reasons that racism is pure sin. I want to share them with you, and I want to give credit where credit is due. But as I process these again and afresh anew these last two or three weeks, Number one, he says, racism is pure evil. In chapter 12, verse 9, we read this scripture, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling. You know, the word there means to be bonded together like super glue. Cling to what is good. Abhor evil. One of the illustrations that he uses there and I've used in many, many sermons, the word evil, if you just add one letter to it, you get the word devil, friend. Evil is from the devil. And so racism is pure evil. And then secondly, racism is pure self-righteousness. It, it, the illustration is in Luke chapter 18 where the Pharisee stood and he prayed uh, thus with himself and said, God, I, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. Self-righteousness is racism. And then thirdly, racism of course, violates the Great Commission to go into all of the world and make disciples. And then not only that, number four, racism violates the Great Commandment. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. And then number five, racism actually questions God's creation. And in many ways, it, it defies God's creation. Listen to Acts chapter 17. I, I don't know if you've ever read this verse or not, but you need to read it numerous times. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. You realize every one of us, every single one of us, trace our heritage back to Adam and Eve. One blood we came from. We all are born with the Adamic sin nature imputed to our soul, which makes us lost and in need of a savior. And then racism even questions God's plan. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, and they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed to God by your blood out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. And then finally, racism questions God itself. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Now, an illustration that Dr. Morris used that I want to share with you today is one that uh, really kind of hit home with me because I had, I had uh, he used a bottle of water and uh, I brought a bottle of water with me today and I'm going to hold it up because I'm going to ask you to do something for me there at home uh, when you see this, and I'll do it again this coming Sunday. But I want you to look, if you can see it, 
And maybe they'll be able to focus really clear in on it. They may not see it at all. But you know what this word right out here says? I got this from playing golf this week. It says, abso pure. Now, can I be honest with you? I've never heard of abso pure water. Not in my life. Man, I use promised water from here at the church with a child's hope. I've done, what do you call that, uh, Aquafina and uh, Dasani and some of these other things. But abso pure. See, if you're facing the bottle, that's what you're reading. But see, I, I'm not seeing that. I, I don't read it at all. Matter of fact, I'm going to get my glasses. That are going to help me. You're seeing abso pure. I'm seeing Nutrition facts, calories, if I hold it real close, total fat. I didn't know there's total fat in water. Oh, good, it's zero. Sodium, and a whole bunch of writing down at the bottom that I can't even read with them. I'd have to get a magnifying glass to read it. You understand something? Here's what you're seeing and reading on one side. Here's what I'm seeing and reading on the other side. And that's the problem with racism in this nation. One group is seeing it this way. Another group is seeing it this way. And listen, I'll never understand what you're seeing if I don't take the time to walk around the bottle and stand next to you and read what you're reading and feel what you're feeling. God help us to understand. It is the job of the Christian to walk around, to have the olive branch, a branch to be what the Scripture calls a peacemaker. Not a treaty writer, not a peacekeeper. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's interesting as you look at the life of Jesus, and let's just kind of use him as the supreme example. Jesus ministered to everyone. He, he ministered to a, a Phoenician woman in Tyre and Sidon. If you remember those two scriptural names, those are Phoenician cities, and they had absolutely rejected Jesus as Savior. And yet he ministered to this Phoenician woman. Jesus mentioned, uh, ministered to the centurion and his servant. Jesus mentioned, uh, ministered to the Samaritan woman at a well. Do you remember as Jesus is walking what's called the Via Dolorosa, the road to Calvary? Uh, as he stumbles along the way, they pick a man out of the crowd gave him the distinct honor to carry part of the cross for Jesus to Golgotha's Hill. His name was Simon of Cyrene. He was, he was a black man. Understand Jesus ministered to all. Now, let's, let's take one more biblical example. Turn to Acts chapter 13 real quickly, and let's just look at the early church. Because if we will look at the early church, the early church is going to give us some real clues as to its structure, who was included, who were the leaders. And if we're not careful, man, sometimes when the Bible starts listing names, we get tired of trying to pronounce them. Can I get a witness? And we just skip all the way through it and go to the very end. Well, listen to what the scripture says. Now, in the church, that was at Antioch. Please note, there were certain prophets and teachers. Two of them you're going to know real well. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. He was in, that's the Herod of the Bible, the persecuting guy. This guy was brought up in his household. Now he's a believer in Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, Saul of Tarsus, who doesn't need any introduction. You understand Simeon was from Niger, from a country in Africa. He was a black man. Lucius of Cyrene, those are northern Africa countries. Two of the five people that the Bible says were certain prophets and teachers at the church at Antioch were multicolored, multicultured. That's how God always works and how he always ministered. And by the way, just a little point there. The word Niger there is where we come up with the slang for a very, very awful word that is used in this nation today for racial discrimination and to belittle another human being. God forgive us. Uh, we who have been guilty and anyone who would ever be guilty in the future 
of that horrible sin. You see, I brought another prop with me today. And uh, you'll be able to see it. I'm going to hold it up right here in front of me. And uh, it just so happens that uh, Papa John's has a lot more faith than I do because they got on here, Cincinnati Bengals win, you win. All right? So they got a lot of faith. But understand something. I know this is a little silly illustration, but just kind of bear with me for just a moment. Just a moment. You see, I love pizza. Uh, That's a well-known fact. I could quote to you right now, probably four, maybe even five phone numbers of pizza delivery places here in Lebanon. All right? I don't even have to look at this one. 934-2222. Can I get a witness? They even know my name. When, they, when, I, when I call, they say, hey, pastor, you want your order you had last time? Everybody all right? So listen, well, this is what I'm going to try and tell you. I went down and got one of their boxes, asked them if I could have it to use as an illustration. Listen, this box cost 27 cents. 27 cents. When I place an order for a Papa John's pizza or La Rosa's or Pizza Hut or Domino's or Marco's, any of the other guilty that's out there that I get them from, okay, I'm not paying for the pizza box. I'm paying for what's inside the pizza box. See, this thing only costs 27 cents. All I want it to do, I want it to be secure and I want it to be clean. That's all I'm really concerned about. See, but what I am concerned about and what gives this box value is what is on the inside of the box. Less than two weeks ago, a delivery guy coming up to my front porch stumbled, coming to my front porch, and I I nearly had a heart attack as the guy was juggling my pizza box all over my front yard. He was skilled. I cannot tell you how skilled he was because he didn't drop what was on the inside. So understand something. In our country, If we don't start looking about what's on the inside instead of what's on the outside, we're going to disintegrate as a nation. We need to start looking at the character of a man before we look at the color of a man. That's what Jesus would teach us. That's what the scripture teaches. So I don't know what kind of box you're in this morning, but trust me, the inside you are made in the image of God. He put a soul inside of you, and He loves you, and He values you more than you could ever ever imagine. So let me get rid of the pizza box and let's dive back in. My prayer is Father teach us to look at a person's character and not his color. Let us judge a man by what he does and not how he looks. Now in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8 of that chapter, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, very, very familiar. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and that you would prove what is that good, what is that acceptable will of God. Remember what he says? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, don't miss it, by the renewing of your mind. Listen, our minds have got to change about some things if the issue of racism is going to change. But in those first eight verses, Paul has laid out a doctrinal foundation from the chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 12, verse 8. He's laid out a doctrinal foundation that we are justified by faith alone. We are sanctified and set apart unto Christ, and we should be dedicated to the Christian life. Now. From chapter 9, 12, or chapter 12, verse 9, through the rest of the book, through chapter 16, Paul is going to uh, speak to us on specific ways in which the believer must live their life in obedience to God's word and bring glory to his name. The call to practical, holy living, set apart living, in, uh, in the, is the climax of what I call one of the richest epistles ever, ever written. In that epistle, Paul will say, listen, uh, he'll give us about 25 things to chew on. That's why I said next week and the week after we're going to finish this message. And he's going to break it down for us in uh, four basic areas in verses 9 through 21. In uh, verses chapter 12, verse 9, He's going to give us a little trilogy right there of three personal things we have to do. In uh, verses 10 through 13, he's going to talk about what we do in relationship to the family of God. 
Thirdly, in verses 14 through 16, he's going to talk about our duty to all people. And then man, I'm telling you, he's going to turn up the heat. Trust me on this one. He's going to talk to us about our duty towards our personal enemies. Man, this is going to get real. This is Christianity 101 at its finest, purest, rawest form. Can we do this? Can we resolve to say, I'm going to grow. I'm going to be open to the instruction of God's word. I'm going to be open to walking around the other side of the bottle so I can see what God's Word wants to see to me afresh. I'm going to get rid of my own predisposed opinion, maybe even something I've been taught by my heritage that is so anti-biblical. And I'm going to look afresh and anew at God's Word and allow that Word to transform my life. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your Word today. Thank you that that Word is alive and it is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrows. And listen, Father, thank you that it is a critic of the thoughts and intents of our heart. Oh, Holy Spirit, Word of God, speak to us these next few weeks. Change our heart, I pray. Give us a heart of repentance, a heart of compassion. And Father, as I make some real challenges, to our people to change these next couple of weeks. May those be embraced through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you've got questions, if you have any questions on how to be saved, why don't you go right now and fill that out. If you made a decision for Christ even today or you need prayer, go to that connection card. We'd love to talk with you. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Church, I hope that you were as encouraged by that word as I was. As a matter of fact, why don't we take a second right now and right where you're watching this video, get into the chat and just drop a thanks, Pastor Tom, because that word was amazing. And it's a blessing to be under the leadership of such a loving and strong pastor. Mm, it's good. You know, I'm going to give you a couple seconds just to do it now. Go ahead. Did you do it? <laughs> well, good. Now, church, we wanted to take this moment to offer you the opportunity to give. Now, I want to encourage you right now because at our meetings, we kind of talk about where our giving is going and, uh, and, and go over you know, some of the impacts that it's making. And because of the way that you give, we are still supporting our missionaries around the world. We are still supporting our church plants around the world. And we are making a massive impact together 
here in the uh, community of Lebanon, Ohio. So it is such an amazing thing that you are doing as you practice Romans 12, 10, and you are outdoing one another in showing honor, honoring God, honoring your church community and your church family. Such a good thing. So we just, we want to pray right alongside you as you go to the Lord and ask him how he would have you continue to serve. Now, as you decide to give, there are a lot of great ways to do it. There are going to be links in your chat right now, but also the easiest way to give is to text an amount to 84321. You'll be sent a link, tap the link, search for Urban Crest, and you are done. So it's very, very quick, very, very easy. So God bless you as you make those important decisions. But for now, church family, it's been an amazing day. It's been so great to spend this time with you and to grow alongside of you. It is, uh, it's just, it's always such a privilege. So thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to like this video, to subscribe to the channel, and uh, we will see you next week. We'll see ya. Bye.